Welcome to our series, Chasing the Wind, a survey of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, where we'll learn some important life lessons from someone who had the resources to chase after everything this world has to offer. We hope you'll discover through this series what the author ultimately discovered. It's more rewarding to pursue the maker of the wind than chase after it. Let's now join Pastor Alan Brooks of New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, as he leads us in our study. I want to set the table for where we're going this morning in the study, and it's to share a story that Ravi Zacharias tells, and maybe some of you have actually heard it, but he talks about a preacher who was asked to give a message at the graveside for a homeless man. And they had indicated that they didn't know that he had any family or any friends that were in the area, and so it would probably be well, maybe just him there at the graveside, but felt like you know, he deserved to have some words spoken. Well, he went into this backwood area there in Tennessee, as they shared with me at the earlier uh, service, they call them hollers. You know, y'all, y'all knew that, right? Hollers, right? <laughs> but so he gets in the back of this holler, but he's lost and he can't find exactly where he's going. So now he's late and he finally gets and he sees the field and he sees these guys with a backhoe and oh my gosh, they're getting ready to fill in the hole. So he rushes over there real quick and says, wait, 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 I'm the preacher who was called to give some words. You know, let me just give some words real quickly and then you can finish with the uh, filling of the hole. And so he stands there and he's thinking, you know, sad, how sad it is that this man doesn't have any other family or friends, you know, there, you know, at his service. And so he gives his most eloquent words just to say the best about who this man probably was in life. And as he's walking away, one of the other men, as he's talking to the other workers, he says, you know what? That was amazing. He said, I've never seen anything like it. And I've been digging these septic tanks for 20 years. He obviously was a little more lost than he realized. He wasn't even at the right place. But even though he was giving sacred words, he was at, I would call it, a secular place. And that's part of what we're going to look at today, is we're going to look at those occasions where, in fact, we're giving even sacred words at the wrong place or vice versa. Maybe we're just simply being secular in our words at a sacred place. In our series in Chasing the Wind, we've seen Solomon look at all these different areas and the different activities of life, man's work, man's home, his pleasure, all of these pursuits that we have on this earth, as he calls it, under the sun. But now what Solomon does is he goes to a sacred place. So if you haven't already done so, I'd ask you to open your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we're going to jump into the first set of verses here this morning. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they're doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. So we're at this place, this place known as the temple. And even to backtrack a little bit before this, You might recall that the second king of Israel, King David, wanted to build a house for God. But God said, no, not by your hand. And he indicated it would be by the hand of his son. And scripture reveals that Solomon was in fact the person who built the temple. And Solomon literally spared no expense. He had great amounts of gold coming in, as you know, and he spent great amounts to build this magnificent house for God. Second Chronicles records his words. It says, this must be a magnificent temple, but notice why. 
because our God is greater than all other gods. So church, let me ask you, do you believe that? Our God is greater than all other gods. And that truly sets the stage for what Solomon is telling us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says that when they finished completion of God's house, the temple, that they had this grand ceremony, this dedication. And here's what's recorded further on in 2 Chronicles 5. It says the trumpeters and singers performed together in unison to praise and to give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words. Notice the words. He, God, is good. True? His faithful love endures forever. Amen? At that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. Wow, can you imagine what it had to be like to be there? Wow, that's just absolutely amazing. That's where Solomon is going with this first instruction in Ecclesiastes 5. He says, guard your steps. What do you think he means about that? Answer that with me. What do you think it means to guard your steps before you come into the house of God? A little louder. Get right. Okay, your heart is right before God. What else? To be thoughtful. Confess sin. Part of being right, I think, as well. But if you put this all together, it's the idea that we're mindful, we're alert, we're aware that, wow, we're entering into the very presence of a living God. And they had seen that tangibly, visibly, when the cloud came down. And that's the awe that's being brought to this idea As I said this week, it made me think a little bit about that scene out of a very familiar movie, The Wizard of Oz. Do you remember when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the the lion were going in? You know, they were shaking as they were entering in to the area there where the Oz, the great and powerful Oz, supposedly was. They were in awe of him. And that's what Solomon is saying to those who would enter the house of God, that they should be in awe of God. And he says, we should not offer the sacrifice of fools. I love that expression, the sacrifice of fools. But unpack it with me here for a moment. What I believe Solomon was referring to, and we'll see that as he carries it out, is the idea that we would enter in mindlessly into our worship, into the presence of God, that we would go through the motions of worship, of our religious movement, but our heart wasn't in it. That's what he's saying not to do. Don't offer the sacrifice of fools. Don't go through the motions And as he points out, those who do don't even realize that they're doing evil. They come into the very presence of God and don't realize that by their activity, by their mind, by their heart, they are in fact doing evil. Verse 2, he says, don't be rash with your mouth. Notice he didn't say a mouth rash. He said, don't be rash with your mouth. I like the way the message translates verse 2. It says, don't shoot off your mouth or speak before you think. Don't be too quick to tell God what you think he wants to hear. Not that any of us have ever been guilty of that, right? God's in charge, not you. Hallelujah, yeah. The less you speak, the what? The better. Let our words be few. 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, was known as a man of few words. He tells the story in an autobiography about how he was sitting 
at a dinner table at a dinner party and a woman sat down beside him and knowing of his reputation, she says, Mr. President, I just want you to know I made a bet with a friend. And I told that friend I could get you to say more than three words tonight. And he looked over at her and said, you lose. <laughs> Let your words be few. Don't be rash with your mouth. And the analogy that Solomon draws here is that a fool's many words are similar in terms of this idea of a dream. In other words, as we speak to God, sometimes we come off as a fool because we're just throwing so many words out there. In some cases, just parroting phrases that we've said before, that we've heard others say before. And it's not unlike a dream. We've all had them. Dreams are crazy, aren't they? I love how the movie Inside Out puts that together, you know, and shows this cast putting all these different props together. And, bah, bah, here's this story. But a dream is basically this weird collection of ideas in some consensus of a plot. And most of us wake up and go, what was that? What was that about? Don't you wonder how many times God's asking that same question of us as a fool? What was that? What was all that nonsense, all those words that you were spewing forth? Solomon goes on to say to be careful about making vows to God. That we should not come back to the messenger, which most scholars believe is the temple priest, and to tell the messenger that, oh, hey, wait, wait, my bad. <laughs> you know, I didn't really mean what I said about that vow that I made to God. It turns out, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay that vow. I made a mistake. And he's saying, don't ever do that. The interesting thing about making vows in the Hebrew culture, according to the law, vows were not mandatory. Sacrifices, those were mandatory. Vows were not. They were optional. But what was not optional is that if you made a vow to God, you had to pay it. No questions asked. You could never come back and say it was a mistake. Because to do so was to do evil before God. Wow, I wonder how many of us in our culture don't think about that enough. I've got to tell you, I've been in many hospital rooms where people made vows about getting right with God. Or the more common one I hear, you know what, if God gets me out of this, I'm going to start going back to, to church. And you know what's true to some of them, they go back for a time, but for very, not very long, many of them are right back on the same course they were before. Not even mindful of the vow that they had made before God. Here's a great lesson, I think, to be learned here today. The house of God is a sacred place. Do you believe that? Now, some of you might argue that the temple that Solomon was speaking of is not the same as the church, and you would be right. The temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. It's been underground pretty much ever since then. The presence of God, though, left that temple long before it was actually destroyed in 70 AD. So I'm not trying to equate the idea of the temple and the church being one and the same, but it's actually something much deeper, something much more personal than that that I'm getting at. Paul in the New Testament tells us this. You don't realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit. Don't you see that you can't live however you please? squandering what God paid such a high price for? See, I'm not trying to equate the idea of coming to this house, this building, this church building, as coming before God. I'm talking about where you live, where you go, where you are. See, if you're in Christ, Christ is in you. If Christ is not in you, you've got another issue you need to deal with. But if Christ is in you, then wherever you are, there is the temple of God. Now let me ask you the hard question. You don't have to answer this. Are you guarding your steps? Or are you just kind of taking that for granted? This is what it is. God is always with me. Wherever I go, he goes with me. Or are we being more mindful about coming before God? 
Something I think we need to do is I think we need to be more reverent of God's place in our life. Solomon, I said, spared no expense with his gold in building that temple. Your God spared no expense in buying our temple. His expense wasn't gold, it was blood. It was the blood of his son. It's what we celebrate here in a little bit in communion. A constant reminder that God paid the ultimate price so that we could have life. And if you have not already put your faith in that, then today's a day that I would suggest you consider it again. I'm fairly confident that most of you have heard the good news before. That Christ came to this earth to give his life as a ransom for many. So that whoever would believe would not perish, but would have eternal life. I've chose to put my faith in that. Many in this room have chose to put your faith in it. But the bigger question is, have you personally? Because it isn't what I've done or what others have done. It's what have you done? Have you put your faith in the name of Jesus Christ? The ultimate price was paid. A gift is being offered to you of salvation. To know that when you leave this life, you have a life that's everlasting with the Father who is in heaven. The ultimate price was paid to give you that gift. But all of us need to be more reverent of God's place in our life. I don't know how many of you saw this in the news here the other day. But this picture is of a local officer. His name is Orion Holtz and his wife, Rebecca. They made news because they adopted a baby whose mother was addicted to heroin. And so uh, President Trump had a photo shoot with them before the uh, national address on Monday, and they had this picture taken. I've wondered as I looked at that, how that went. Do you think the officer just came in and said, hey, Donnie, what's going on, Prez? Right? So I'm willing to bet that didn't happen. You'll also notice, I'm pretty sure, because he's an officer of the law, and like all officers of the law, they work out. You notice he's not in his gym clothes? He's wearing his uniform. It's a sign of respect, whether he likes the president or not, we don't know. But it's a sign of respect for the position that this man holds. This place in which this picture is being taken. The Oval Office of the capital of the United States of America. It's not the temple, but it is a secular place of great prominence, held by a man who has a title and a position of great prominence in this country. And this man, the officer, is showing respect for that office by wearing his uniform. Now, I don't know, it's not said whether his wife went out and bought a new outfit, but I'm just guessing, right? Most of you ladies, if you were going to have a picture taken with the President of the United States, am I wrong? You would probably get a new dress or something to go with, right? But again, it's the point of respect. It's the point of this is something significant. I'm going to a special place to meet a special person, and I want to show the ultimate form of respect for it. How many of you recognize the need in your life to be more reverent? to be more mindful of God's place in your life? Most of us do. But here's the bigger question. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to do anything about it? Or the words that I've just spoken, are you going to go in one ear and right out the other? Are you going to leave this building and go right back to the way you've been living life without any more mindfulness or alertness about who God is in your life than when you came in here today? I hope that's not the case. I'm saddened for you if that is the case. Because part of what I believe God's asking us to look at today is what are you going to do to show the reverence that you personally have for God? Here's something I would encourage you with. It's not about dressing up. It's not about putting on a suit or your best dress as you sit down to do your Bible study. What I think you need to do is this. You need to be wholly present with a holy God. You need to have a fear of God, recognizing that he is the creator of all things. I was looking out last night at all the stars in the sky, 
And it reminded me of how even as a child, I would look out and realize there were all these unimaginable worlds beyond the scope of this world. And I've got to tell you, as a child and even as an adult today, it overwhelms me to look at the stars at night. I'm in awe of it. But then I have to process the next thought, and hopefully you'll process it with me. My God, your God, made that. And as awe-inspiring as that is, as grand as that is, he's even more awe-inspiring. He's even grander than that. And shame on me if I'm not showing the level of respect for that, the reverence for that, that I should have. I shouldn't be showing up to prayer with God, go, hey, Jesus, how's it hanging, right? What's up? He's God. He's the creator of the universe. He deserves our reverence and our respect. We need to be mindful that he's chosen to live inside of us. I don't want to offer the sacrifice of fools, do you? But what does that mean practically for you and I? I think in some cases it means getting up in the morning, doing your Bible study, check, looking at the prayer app going, wow, there's some things I ought to pray for, check, and then going on the rest of your day. See, you were just going through the motions, saying, I know as a good, faithful Christian, I should be reading my Bible every day, I should be talking to God every day, check, check, got it. Is that what God's looking for? No. Don't offer the sacrifice of fools. It's not that we shouldn't be doing those things, but it's our heart behind it. It's not something I have to do. It's something I want to do. Is it something you want to do? Or do you get up and think, eh, I've got to do my Bible study. Yeah, better say some prayers. I might get hit by a truck today or something. <laughs> Let's get serious about our reverence of God. Don't offer the sacrifice of fools. The other thing that I see in Solomon's passage here is that we need to listen more and talk less. Do you think that officer, when he went into the Oval Office, just talked the president's ear off? I doubt it. Most people, when they meet somebody of great authority, somebody who's greatly distinguished, they're mindful that they should talk less and listen more. How much more so that should be true of us, that we should listen more and talk less with God. It's kind of ironic to me that Jesus speaks to this very issue in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, he says, don't babble on like the Gentiles do, those who didn't believe in God, because they're foolish. They think by adding all of these words that somehow they'll get God to hear them. And Jesus tells his disciples, God already knows what you need before you even come to him. You don't have to inform of him of all the details. He knows all the details. In fact, ironically, he gives a model prayer that some of us know as the Lord's Prayer. It's probably more accurately to be the disciples' prayer because it was a model. It was an example. Do you know how many words in English there are in the, quote, Lord's Prayer? It's about 50. There's not that many of them. Many of us, just as we've been talking about what we were going to do this afternoon, have spent more than 50 words just telling somebody in the hallway about what we were going to do. It's not a lot. What would happen if in our life we were mindful of he's God in heaven and we're just simply here on earth? He's got it all figured out. He knows it all. I don't need to inform him about anything. I can just simply bring my simple prayer to him and go, well, I'm putting this in your hands, God. Take care of it. The best prayer in the Bible, in my opinion, was the shortest. It was Peter. Remember it? He's about to drown. Lord, save me. He didn't have to say, hey, Lord, this is Peter. You know, I'm the fisherman guy that you uh, brought one day along, and you said, hey, you could be part of my tribe here, and we're going to do this. And, you know, there's this thing going on right now, you know, the Sea of Galilee right here. You know, it's one of the biggest lakes in uh, all of... Are you serious? He doesn't have time to 
be grandiose in everything that he's saying. He gets right to the point and lets his Lord know because his Lord knows what he needs even before he spoke the words. Charles Spurgeon said it best. He says, it's not the length of our prayers, but the strength of our prayers that makes the difference. Otherwise, we might as well be that preacher right above the septic tank. We're throwing out a bunch of holy words, but it ain't going too far. Let's go back to our passage in Ecclesiastes, verse 8. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter. For the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. These two verses, verses 8 and 9, are some of the most debated verses of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. And it's pretty mysterious up on the surface. But let's dig in a little bit and let's see if we can see what Solomon's getting at. First of all, I think he's pointing to what most of us know. There is official corruption. Corruption in officials. In fact, verse 8, he says, don't be surprised when you see these things. The message translates it and says, exploitation filters down from one petty officer to another. There's no end to it and nothing that can be done about it. It is what it is. Ultimately, it's an issue of power and control. Lord Acton wrote in a letter in 1887, he says, power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Verse 9, it says, there's a gain for a land in every way. The word land could be translated as nation. And part of Solomon's point here is that everyone is taking a cut, including the king, off of the land. And that's pretty much the way life works, as he points out. But he does make another point here that I think it's easy for us to miss. Even a corrupt government is better than anarchy. Do you know what I mean by anarchy? Literally, anarchy means lawlessness. That everyone does what's right in their own sight. Do you know there's a movement within our land for anarchy? You'll see people wearing shirts on occasion that says, Anarchy Now. But it's the idea that we ought to just do away with government and let everybody decide to do what's right in their own mind. I wonder how that might go. We can see through history, Israel tried that for a, a time, and the world imploded. See, the reality is the lesson to be learned here is a poor government is better than no government. A poor government is better than no government. There's going to be corruption. Help me with that. Why is that? Why is there going to be corruption? Because governments are run by people. And as people, we have a tendency to be corrupt. I've seen people enter into government as I believe were good people, but have become corrupted by it and the power that comes to them through it. And the truth is that every form of government, whether it's a democracy or a republic like ours, or whether it's a socialistic or a communist country or a regime, they all have their problems. Some of them obviously more than others. But some, or a poor government, is always going to be better than lawlessness, than no government at all. And we just need to deal with it from there. So what do we do, though? I think this is important. We should be praying for our leaders. As I shared with the first service, I have great conviction about this because I often don't think as often as I should to pray for the leaders of this country and of this state and of this city. I just don't. I'm just acknowledging that. Shame on me. I need to do better there. Maybe some of you need to do better there. Because that's part of the problem, I would suggest, is that we're not praying for some of these good people, and they become corrupted because God's power hasn't been spoke into their life through prayer. The second thing that I think you and I need to do is we need to work to elect people who stand for law and order. You know, if somebody doesn't have a respect for the law, then that's not somebody we should be electing. 
Now, we can argue that there's some laws that aren't good. Great, let's change them so they become good laws. But if it's the law, then we have to respect it until that law has been changed. Because otherwise, everybody's just making up their own mind about what's a good law or not. We've got to pray for these people. We've got to work to elect the right ones. Join with me back in verse 10. Solomon segues into this same thought that he's been in before. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is the father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. And as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, sickness, and anger. Some of you know the name of John D. Rockefeller, a very wealthy billionaire, as I recall. Somebody asked him one time, how much money does it take for a person to be satisfied? you got to love his answer. John Rockefeller's answer was, just a little bit more than he has. Here's a billionaire. Here's a guy who's got more money than any of us could ever hope to spend. And he recognizes that money and wealth never satisfies. Now, we've already been over this several times in this series because this is a common place that Solomon comes back to. This place where what people do is they make money and riches their God. They make sacrifices for it. They sacrifice their time. They sacrifice their talent so they have more riches. They give it all to accomplish success and ambition. It's their God. But I want to look at it from a different angle today, another angle that I think Solomon is getting at here today. And the first thing that he touches on is that when resources increase, responsibility increases. Any of you have ever had the experience, as most of us have, of living in an apartment and then buying a home. And it's so exciting at first, right? Wow, our first home, it's ours, it doesn't belong to somebody else. And then all of a sudden, you got to go buy insurance, you got to pay property tax. When something breaks down, you got to pay for it. When resources increase, responsibility increases. Solomon points to another thing that happens. We see this when people win the lottery or when somebody gets a big inheritance from their family. All of a sudden, there's people that show up at their place like, wow, I didn't even know we were friends, right? You say you're family, right? See, people show up to come experience and help you in spending some of that. The New Living Translation puts this on verse 11. It says, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? Solomon also talks about worse, though, are these that believe they have the Midas touch. Y'all know what I mean by that when I say Midas touch? You know, there's a fable about a guy named King Midas who supposedly everything he touched turned to gold. But there's that also thing that happens for some people when they're successful in life. Seems like everything's going their way. Every deal goes through for them. All's good. They have the Midas touch. The problem with that, of course, is that we become irresponsible sometimes, don't we? We think that, hey, we can't do any wrong. And before we know it, we've bet the whole farm, as they say, on this one business deal that's really going to pay off. And we all have heard this story, maybe even experienced this story in some cases, where the person bet the farm and they lost it, lost it all. 
And Solomon's dealing with that issue here. He says, wow, here's this guy who literally has nothing he's able to pass on as an inheritance. And for those of you that don't know, in that ancient culture, it was a big deal to be able to leave an inheritance to your offspring. We find that as well in Proverbs, where it says, good people leave an inheritance to their grandchildren. When I read this part about the man being naked just as he came, it made me think of another person who lamented in the same way. Do you remember that guy? Job. Job in chapter 1, as everything was being stripped from him, he said, naked I came to this earth, naked I'll leave. I think Job at least had a better attitude about it. Verse 18 says, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. Notice what he says. This is a gift from whom? From God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Here again is that place that Solomon has landed. Learn how to be content. Appreciate what you have. The place where you are. You know, I've seen this with both groups of people. I've seen people who have had very little that were content in having very little. I've seen people who were very wealthy, who were content. Now, you could argue, well, it's easy to be content when you have a lot. But even as we see from J.D. Rockefeller, that isn't necessarily so. Even within that realm, people have to say, I don't need a little bit more. What I have is plenty. In fact, what I would share is that some people who have plenty struggle sometimes. I've seen this in my own life where I look at how God has blessed me and I feel guilty when I see people that I at least think aren't as blessed as I am. Some of you have had that experience as well. I don't think guilt is necessarily what God wants us to feel. In some cases, he does. He wants us to feel guilty because we're stingy. We're selfish. We're not giving of the abundance that God has given us. But if you're gracious, if you're giving of the abundance that God has given you, you should not feel guilty about it. You should feel thankful for it. That God has blessed you. And what I've discovered, the more you give to others, the more God gives you because he knows you're going to distribute it out to others. For me, the benchmark became 10%. When I started tithing, this biblical idea of giving a tenth of my income to the things of God, it was hard, just to be honest with you. It was hard to get there, mainly because of what problem I had. What was my problem? Selfishness. It meant I wasn't going to be able to spend that money on the newer car, the newer whatever, right? Right? But when I gave it away to the things of God, you know, another thing started to happen. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel so guilty anymore because I knew that I was seeking to be generous. And the other thing that starts to happen is you realize, hey, I, I can do more. You know, 10% isn't, isn't enough. I can give more than that. And what God will do is he will continue to bless you and prosper you. And he wants you to find contentment in that. He wants you to be thankful full in that. See, because you're not worshiping the resources, you're not worshiping the riches, you're seeking to receive them so you can distribute them back out and let God use them in his world. Don't be selfish, don't be stingy. That should be obvious, right? But the lesson I think more importantly that we need to take away is enjoy the life that God has given you. I'm confident that I've saddened my God sometimes. I've saddened him because I've not nearly been as appreciative of his goodness and his gifts in my life as he would have hoped for me to be. And it's because my eyes were on the wrong thing. He wanted me to bless others with that goodness, with his favor, and to be thankful for that favor in my life. 
There's an interesting story about a husband and wife who, after many years of marriage, had decided that they were going to separate and see other people. Basically because they were bored. They really felt like each other wasn't meeting each other's needs. So they separated. The man decided that what he would do is he would join one of these dating services, you know, these online services where you post something about yourself. He didn't put a picture up. He just put some information about the kind of person that he was looking to be in a relationship with. And before long, he had a response from this woman. They agreed to meet at a restaurant. And when they got there together, they realized that they were looking at the husband and wife of the relationship. Ironically, the woman that he was looking for was already his wife. The man that she was looking for was already her husband. But they had become blinded. They had lost the point of satisfaction and contentment in what they had. They thought, like so many of us, that what's on the other side of that fence is better than what I have on this side. Don't let the enemy, don't let your flesh fool you. God wants you to find that place of contentment right where you live. Amen? Pray with me. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.